Welcome in episode 113, I believe, of the Jesus Follower ish. We'll go with it. Yeah. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined by Pastor Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Glad to be back with you again this week. It's, uh, it's an interesting topic. I was getting ready to say excited about the topic. <laughs> I, they're, they're, after I just said what I said before, we opened things up. So uh, it's an interesting topic. It'll be good to discuss it and good to be informed today. Today and so that's that's the most exciting part about it being informed. <laughs> we'll try. The more I read and research this particular topic, the more I feel uninformed. But <laughs> know, uh, right? we don't enjoy this topic the most. But uh, we want to say hi to anyone who uh, might be joining in. We're kind of bearing the lead as to what we're talking about. But this episode last year, I think, is our most watched episode, at least on YouTube, uh, ah. ever. So I know every single one of those viewers is a member of Rolling. Hills Baptist Church, where we <laughs> minister here in Fairfield, Ohio. Not really. But uh, since last year, we've gotten uh, a revamp, epic new intro music. Yeah. Uh, we're in the same spot, uh, but we like to hope that we're older and wiser in the Lord. So uh, right. we'll see if that's true. <laughs> we're definitely older. We're definitely older. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can be definitive on that. <laughs> so. Wiser? I don't know. But yeah. uh, we are going to talk about the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting meeting that is coming up in just a couple of weeks. I think it's June 12th ish around that week. Yeah, we are going my wife and I and Daniel, uh, Lord willing, we're going to be headed to Indianapolis, the long way land. Thankfully, it's only like an hour and a half for us, which is fantastic. Yeah, uh, to the annual meeting of the Southern yeah. Baptist Convention. I don't know if you all know this uh, from Rolling Hills, but we are a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. And um, happily so. There's a lot that involves, uh, a lot that is involved rather of being a Southern Baptist. Yeah. And that's not what we're necessarily going to talk about today. But uh, Daniel, what does that uh, mean for you? Why are we a Southern Baptist church? Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and there's probably as as our world goes the direction that it is, there's probably more and more questions about that. You know, there's a lot of non-denominational churches that are kind of coming up and, and growing very rapidly, and so um, there seems to be, culturally speaking, a move kind of in the direction of non-denominational in a big way uh, in the past few years. But for us, you know, the Southern Baptists, one of the things that they do uh, very well or strive to do is adhere to the principles of the Scripture. Scripture. And so one of the reasons why growing up in my life, my parents and, and what I was taught, the reason why we lean that direction is because we could we could go to this place and we can find out and knew exactly what they represented and what they stood for, generally speaking, whenever we were even beginning to enter that facility or be a part of that church, which meant a lot because you weren't going in kind of blind trying to figure it out. You generally knew what you were going into. And so one of the biggest things for us was their adherence to the word. Word of God, or they're striving to be obedient and be found obedient there, uh, and that means that means a whole lot. That's a that's a real blessing, and so we we kind of lean that way. Another cool thing that they do is they they try to they have this um, organization. We're going to talk about it today, so I won't spill all the beans on this, but um, they basically work together. They strive to work together, and I think uh, we both think that they strive to do that well. Uh, not that they always get it just right, but yet the effort and the goal is uh, in front of them and they want to advance the gospel together. And so they have a system kind of set up in order to do that. Which is yeah. another another really good thing about the Southern Baptists, I think, uh, the cooperation um, between the different churches in that uh, denomination. So those are just a couple reasons why, you know, it is a blessing to be a part of. And it's good to be able to join together with other brothers and sisters that are trying to um, just fulfill what the word says and be obedient and, and love Christ in the process. So. Absolutely. And there's a lot that we could talk about with the Southern Baptists. Uh, but the biggest thing I think for us in our setting is that it's not really a denomination in the mainline or traditional sense where there is a governing body that we're subject to. Some denominations set themselves up like that, say, uh, oh, I can't. You know, Pres Presbyterians, for in instance, have a hierarchy where there's a authoritative structure and that's kind of their model that they take from the Bible as well. And they're yeah. right to be wrong, but no, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. the main thing about Southern Baptist is that there's no uh, 
head honcho. Like there is a president, but the point of the convention is the churches cooperating together. And it's yeah. kind of like a ground up kind of thing. At least that's the way it's designed. So there's over 47,000 individual churches I'm reading on the Google machine. And uh, that equals out to millions and millions of people throughout uh, America. And I think uh, the world, maybe, I don't know what constitutes Southern Baptist church, if that's just statewide or what, but uh, millions of people that are involved with a Southern Baptist church. Yeah. So that's kind of, we believe that as Baptist and individual church autonomy, uh, that even though God died and Christ died for the church as a whole, like the universal church, that each individual church has their uh, own accountability yeah. and structure before God yeah. in the New Testament. That's how we read it and believe it and structure ourselves. So the Southern Baptist Convention is not a denomination in a hierarchical sense. Right, that's the way right. I say that word. Yeah. But it's a collection of local churches that uh, submit to each other and cooperate in things uh, like missions. That's yeah. what you alluded to. Uh, mainly, there's a thing called the Cooperative Program that is a hot topic in this year's convention. Uh, and we'll get to that. But the point of the annual meeting, it's a giant business meeting. Uh, very exciting or not. Uh, but you uh, <laughs> gather together and it's uh, one giant uh, uh, party in that way. Uh, yeah, it's, parties it, loosely. It does denote that, that even though there isn't a hierarchical system, you know, where the the top down, it's more uh, designed differently. There is accountability. Oh yeah, and and that's, that's kind of this giant business meeting, which I know when everyone hears that, they're like, "Ooh, that sounds." Uh, yeah, I probably won't go that. No, but even, unless you know, you're a psychopath, yeah, chaos. So what is wrong no. with you? Why would you go there? No, uh, <laughs> but uh, there will be ice cream. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, it is a it is a good way to bring about some of that accountability as it's one place. Place that invites all of this, these entities, these separate auto autonomous entities to come together for the purpose of really, I think I look at it as a big accountability session. You know, mm -hmm. how are we doing with our um, following the scripture, adhering to the words of the scripture and um, in the process of that, because we're people, we have to have some kind of committee or votes to solidify all that. So yeah. that's also a part of it. You know. So. Yeah. Yeah. And we joke about the the corniness of a business meeting and the, you know, the formality of it all. And there are, you know, oddballs that are a part of any situation, but uh, it is a great encouragement. I believe in a great yeah. thing that we're a part of. We believe in it as a church. We give nearly 10% of our uh, income uh, undesignated receipts towards the uh cooperative program and and other i think that's not all towards the cooperative program but to southern baptist causes both yeah. stateside and uh nationally and uh yeah this meeting is just a way to work out things of uh controversial nature as well as just making sure that everything's above board and we have reports from the entities and uh, all that so it's kind of hard to explain in a short amount of time yeah yeah but uh, that's kind of the point of it all is for that accountability as well as uh, just yeah, well, mainly just the accountability. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, man, and it's really not as bad. I mean, I don't mind, you know, business meetings if the business is, is just pertinent as long as it's. And you went last year, you know, it's a yeah. little bit farther last year, and uh, they're they're very concise and seem to be uh, very direct and moving a certain direction very succinctly, which kind of helps the business meeting progress along well and and not get too you know scattered out on things. And so that's that's really good. And we all need that accountability. You know, a lot of times accountability can be tough. And uh, when, when we have to make those hard decisions, it's not always pleasant. But at the end of the day, it's more important that we're adhering to what God wants us to do than anything else. And so it's just a way to help us to make sure that we're doing that, I think. And, um, and so overall, it's it's good. And, then, you know, I, they don't have to have ice cream. You know, we'll still go even if there's no ice cream there. So you know. we'll push for it. Though. It'll be a big it'll be a big we'll plus. A don't get right. me wrong. But no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, we want to come to you, especially people of Rolling Hills Baptist Church to just talk about what's on the horizon for the convention this year, what is going to be discussed, voted on, uh, some of the highlights in order to just keep you informed of what's going on statewide, how that might uh, reflect or 
kick back on our local setting here. Yeah. Which it's encouraging is that it's very minimal in that we are an autonomous local church and that'll always be the case uh, overall with Southern Baptists. So it's nothing like we're going to go and then have new mandates yeah, coming back, yeah. uh, which is encouraging. But uh, let's start with the cooperative program. So a uh, major feat of Southern Baptists is getting people to cooperate together. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Millions of people, 47,000 plus churches is that uh, we were trying, we were talking about doing an event over the summer, didn't pan out this year, but uh, with, with different churches and even like four or five churches yeah. and getting that involved, the conversations are who does what, everyone wants to do their own thing. Yeah, and that's just, yeah. The planning is a lot. So it's a minor miracle or a major miracle that just God has brought these churches together and that yeah. we're able to cooperate on any level at all, yeah. <laughs> let yeah. alone uh, to where there's millions and millions of dollars at play amongst these tens of thousands of churches. So that culminates in the cooperative program is the that is the uh, overall program. Uh, program, for lack of a better term, that uh, Southern Baptists have set up from the ground up that was ratified. I think, I forget, it's been around for a hundred plus years, I think. I don't remember the date. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I just read, pulled up this article here that puts it well. So I'll just read it here. It's from baptistnews.com. So, okay. It says, assume a church gives 10% of its undesignated offerings to the cooperative program. Uh, The current average is half that amount. It says, depending on policies of the state Baptist convention, the church affiliates with anywhere from 40 cents to 60 cents of every dollar uh, will make it to Nashville, which is where the uh, convention nationally is housed. Uh, Those dimes and dollars will accumulate to nearly $200 million given to the national cooperative program this year of every dollar received 50 50 cents goes straight to the SBC International Mission Board and 23 cents goes to the North American Mission Board. Another 22 cents goes to fund theological education at the SBC six seminaries, uh, which we have some near us as uh, Southern, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminaries in Louisville and uh, Midwestern is a little further away. That's probably the next close one, but the, they're around. The remainder goes to the Executive Committee and the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. So that's kind of where the money is kind of neat breakdown of uh, what the money goes to. So for us, I, I forget what that number looked like for what we gave, but it's about 10% of us. Yeah. So, uh, but the issue is with that, to get to the point, is that um, there's been uh, recently, if you kept up with the news, uh, controversy at the top, uh, if you will, of the Southern Baptist. Um, most recently, it was about, I forget, maybe six months ago, uh, there's the head of the, uh, the executive committee, which is kind of the where the CEO goes of the business, the day yeah. business uh, happens. Um, he, it was found out that he had lied on his resume about his education background. So he resigned. Uh, they just now, uh, after some failed attempts, appointed a new, a new head or elected a new head, a CEO of the executive committee. Um, it's, there's been a lot going on, the sexual abuse and everything that happened with that a couple years ago that came to a head and it's still being worked out. We'll get to that yeah. briefly this year. A lot of things have happened to uh, provoke unrest and distrust in the denomination at the top, which kind of is the whole kit and caboodle of uh, the basis of cooperation is that trust. So it's led to a lot of people in a lot of churches uh, withdrawing from giving to the cooperative program at all and either giving right to the international mission board or whatever else and uh, kind of doing their own thing in that way or just giving less uh so we've seen over even the past 17 years i think there's been a decline in membership of southern baptist churches and uh they're not necessarily coordinated, but with that there's been a decline in giving to the cooperative program which is uh both inhibits or the work that the convention has planned to do, you know, the shrinkage of budgets and then uh, on, a, you know, obviously call, it causes caginess between uh, people fighting for budget money. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, so yeah. There's ripple effects from that, but at the center is this cooperative program and uh, it's gotten with the bad press of the convention over the past couple of years. It's kind of come into question of what's the future of the cooperative program. 
Yeah, yeah, it has. And um, I think there's a, a lot of unrest when it comes to that area, especially when you talk about impacting pocketbooks or, or, or just funding to to continue to further the kingdom in ministry in areas. And, you know, it all, I mean, I, I won't say that it completely uh, comes as a surprise, you know, as you have um, things in leadership uh, happening like we've seen happen. It's very unfortunate. I think it's just a reminder for you and I that we, we have to uh, be careful to represent Christ to the best that we can in every area of our life and and not uh, fight against becoming content living in areas where that's not happening um, instead of just repenting and, and coming back to him in those areas because it really does make a difference and the ripple effect doesn't often just or hardly ever just affects us it affects others um, and so just a, a good reminder for us in that I think in the Bible is so faithful to make that clear um, and in just different places I was you know we've been studying here lately in first Timothy 4 for and Paul's instruction to Timothy in the in the spirit about how he just needs to don't let anybody despise him for a youth, but essentially be an example. Um, and I think that that's a, a great word for all of us. Um, and so it, it reminds us of that. It reminds us of, of how important that representation really is. And accountability is, you know, as we talk about the convention and this giant business meeting, it is important that we have accountability between brothers and sisters in the faith because, you know, none of us are um, outside the realm of giving in to temptation. You know, there are possibilities that that could happen and having those accountability partners are important. Uh, Then you think about the bigger the bigger things that that impacts, you know, Andrew mentioned ripples and just the the reality that those funds and they they seem to be used as one of the things that's really amazing amazing about what God does through that cooperation as those funds seem to really be used to advance the kingdom. Like that is the pursuit uh, and the reason for those funds, which is a um, very important thing. We know there's so, still so many people that are lost in the world around us and to be able to, like the IMB, the International Mission Board is uh, such an incredible organization. I think, um, you know, they are, they fund these missionaries to go. A lot of times, you know, they're, uh, they have to raise a lot of support and they have to do it uh, so often um, and that's just an added thing on top of living in another country on top of uh, all of the other cultural shock things that they are dealing with they then have to go back and forth that way but the International Mission Board is a, is a missionary funding organization which is um, uh, through cooperation of churches working together it's an amazing thing um, that God has allowed us to be a part of um, and so all of, all of those things are impacted by, by that and uh, it just it really does come, I think, from a place of just a lack of trust. We, we were reading some articles on that, and and that seems to be a big primary in that. And it, and it happens sometimes even within autonomous bodies of the church. People will start withholding funding even at times, which I'm not saying is right, but they will if they disagree with the leadership. And um, and so ultimately, we know that, that God is, uh, the, Christ is the head of the church. And so um, we, we need not, we need to be careful about that because uh, we have to remember that, you know, when we give, we need to, if we're giving with the right heart, it's going to him anyway, and we have to trust that. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, it does, it does impact more than what sometimes we realize, you know, something as, as minute, or we may think that in our mind, uh, I didn't get it all right on my education, you know, like, oh, yeah. well, in the grand scheme is that so, but it is, I mean, it clearly is, and it does impact a lot more than what sometimes we realize. So uh, when I read that article, it was kind of alarming to see the number decline and and the direction that things are going. And I think it even mentioned that there was um, they, they were kind of short on the budget, you know, because of the decline or, or it fell short. And, you know, all the implications, something to definitely be aware of, something for those that of us that are graciously allowed to be in leadership to always be reminded of or just as a follower of Christ in general, to always realize, look, we we have we need to be accountable ultimately to God, but also to one another and represent Christ well in all that we're doing. And be sure that we pay attention to that because the ripple effects of not doing that can really hurt things. And we don't we don't want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of the kingdom moving forward for his glory and in accordance with his will. So. Um, big, big chunk to think about, but nonetheless, that is the, that is where we are. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's very, uh, complicated. I don't have a full grasp on it at all. Um, but (laughs) honestly, the more I'm reading about, I'm reading this article right now while you're talking, um, 
and it gives a good breakdown. I'll link to it in the description. But it sounds kind of like, and I, I might be wrong, but just uh, what's been happening recently in college football with uh, the NCAA and there's a name, image, and likeness rules coming in. Laws have been changed. And what's happened is that conferences like, you know, Big Ten, SEC have taken a lot of control in the NCAA, like the head governing body. And a lot of this has been in the background or, you know, steps behind to where they're kind of like a lame duck in yeah, some yeah. ways. And it's going to end where there's like existence of college football separate from the NCAA yeah. in terms of like their control, yeah, their yeah. governance. So that's kind of the fear of what's happening here is that even when like the uh, cooperative program giving, although it's like a ton, uh, the, mission, the, the mission boards and the seminaries, they're, the majority of their funding is not coming from the cooperative program. It's you know, obviously very strong contributor to that. But I see like uh, North American Mission Board is uh, like 34.52% uh, through this article. Uh, what this says, it's uh, from the cooperative program. Uh, it's 34% of NAM's budget. Uh, International Mission Board, 33.57. Uh, seminaries, 17% to 29%. Uh, is covered by the cooperative program. So it's kind of, yeah, like this way. And the fear is, is that once giving stops or if this decline keeps happening, yeah. then what are the ripple effects going to be of that? And then what will the Southern Baptist Convention be you yeah, know, yeah. from that in terms of cooperating together? If everyone's doing their own thing, then it's just going to be a fight, a bunch of different heads yeah. instead of one. So no direct, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, ramifications for like voting or anything this year, but it's definitely a big thing to keep track of. Yeah, and definitely. An underlying factor of everything else that's happening. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're, yeah, we can transition. There's a presidential election this year. There are six people currently who are uh, accepting a nomination to run. We won't go through all of them. It's kind of minutia, and it is encouraging overall, especially after the events of last year with Saddleback being um, voted out and other uh, other churches for different reasons. There's this understanding that the Southern Baptists are very overall unified in their yeah. conservatism theologically, especially yeah. compared to other theological bodies and really anyone else in existence today. It's that Southern Baptists are still an outlier and being very conservative and very theologically like-minded overall. Yeah. And the disagreements are in that minutia of being Southern Baptist, which yeah. is encouraging. So there's no like major, major differences between these six candidates. A yeah. lot of it comes down to things like the cooperative program and future of the uh, direction of the financial side of things, as well as theologically. Yeah. That. So people put emphasis in different places. Uh, personally, if my two cents means anything, I'll probably be voting for uh, Mike Keybone if uh if it gets to that point, you know, in there, uh, Bruce Frank is probably my second choice. They're very strong. There's the sexual abuse issue that's been ongoing and probably bigger than what's been reported. Definitely just by the nature of reporting of sexual abuse, yeah, yeah. um, as well, uh, with the cooperative program and all the other things you could research that for yourself. There's good interviews that I've listened to and gotten info from, from Baptist press on YouTube and different interviews and uh obviously there's not one place to go to be like i know your place for southern baptist <laughs> yeah. which is okay. makes it hard your news station yeah right right the one place where yeah. it must flow through so uh it's kind of gate gate kept in that regard it's hard to find yeah who's who but uh yeah, those candidates have drawn my eye for those purposes. A keybone specifically is on the um, the the committee for the sexual abuse reform and uh, has been vocal on that as well, vocal for support of the cooperative program and for reviving that and getting churches involved. And uh, he just seems like a humble and and uh, kind guy that's yeah. not. Uh, doesn't have an ax to grind, which seems to be the case with a few or one or two of the uh of the candidates. So, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I, I, I am not ready to submit my uh, pick as of right now. <laughs> That's a, yeah. I may have looked over some of this stuff, but I have not dove in. So I, I will have to withhold that. But maybe in a later episode before we go, uh, I will reveal that just as a quick sidebar uh, as well. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Reason to listen to later episodes. Yeah, yeah. Daniel's I'm sure Daniel's everyone day. is really concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it came down to one vote, yeah. you would be would the deciding yeah. factor. The decider. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the case. Last year, uh, Bar Barber, who's the current president, was up for re-election, uh, but they you're only allowed one consecutive term of one year, or two consecutive terms, rather. So uh, he can't run for re-election again through the uh, rules of the Constitution, which leads us to our next point, and it's probably the main point, the biggest thing, is that this year, uh, an amendment to the Southern Baptist Constitution, nicknamed the Law Amendment, after uh, its writer, or you know, the guy who brought it into uh, existence, is Virginia Pastor Mike Law, and uh, so, I feel like I've been talking a lot. Let me just give you the cliff notes. So, uh, let me pull this. So, in section, we have bylaws. I'm trying to have too many tabs open. Bylaws that make us Southern Baptists. We have a credentials committee that uh, through this Article 3, Section 1, can deem a church to be in friendly cooperation or not friendly cooperation. That's the language. So that's what led to Saddleback and others being ousted last year. One other and then one other was for sexual abuse uh, reason. But uh, uh, if a church is friendly in friendly cooperation, they, uh, for one, have a faith and practice which closely identifies with the convention's adopted statement of faith, which is the uh, Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That's been in existence uh, since then, and before that, it's gone revisions. That's that. Section two, or second way, has formally approved its intention to cooperate with Southern Baptist Convention. Section th- or point three has uh, contributed to the cooperative program financially or to a convention entity of some sort. And then these uh, next two are more recent, and number four does not act in a manner inconsistent uh, with the convention's beliefs regarding sexual abuse, uh, which led to an ouster uh, last year. And uh, number five does not act to affirm, approve, or endorse uh, discriminatory behavior on the basis of ethnicity. So there's been a Proposed amendment to this point to add a point number six, uh, which would read, and again, I have too many tabs open, but it's something to the effect of, and I'm sure I'll find it right when I pass it to you, Daniel, but something to the effect of only biblically qualified men can hold the, uh, can have the title or hold the office of, I forget exact way it says it, of of pastor in any way of the church, uh, of a Southern Baptist church. Um, so this is a big deal, uh, for one, because it already says this in the Baptist faith and message, which yeah. led to Saddleback's, uh, ouster last year and yeah. the other church. Um, but people to that say yes to this amendment, uh, featuring a lot of people, people like Al Moeller, um, and others, uh, Heath Lambert, uh, he's a biblical counselor, an article that I read, um, and even in that case, it, for an uh, amendment to the Constitution to pass, it has to be adopted two years in a row uh, with two thirds majority vote each time. So last year it passed with two thirds majority. Um, and this year it has to pass again with two years majority or two thirds majority rather, mm-hmm. for it to become a thing. So the majority of people seems like do, at least right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I don't have my pulse on Southern Baptist Twitter, so I don't know if that's changed. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so the people on that side say, why not? It's what the Bible says. We already agree with it. Yeah. Let's codify it to not have the song and dance every year to where we have to have a congregational vote as to whether they are in friendly cooperation with the Baptist faith and message. Let's just put it in there. The people to the uh, the nay side of it that would be against it would still agree with that or else they wouldn't be Southern Baptist anymore after last year. They agree they're very complementary and at least the vast, vast majority uh, would agree that with the language of the amendment, but yeah. disagree in regards of practice and, um, you know, of putting it 
officially in the Constitution. Codifying as, it. Yeah, yeah, right. as, as it's being stated. It's not that, and I think that's, you know, we talked about this a little bit, quite a bit at the beginning, you know, as we were getting ready is yeah. um, we you know, we read um, articles for it and, and against it. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things is um, that the ones that were against it is not that they were not complementarian. It was that they they just were concerned with how far reaching this would actually uh, be, and that if you say it for this particular area, and it's um, um, it creates this unfriendly culture between the convention and these churches, then there's other areas that you have to address. That you need to address as well. It's not um, necessarily right to just pinpoint one area like this, and yeah. um, without without covering them all and so you know it's interesting as we discussed it because uh, like Andrew said we they they kind of covered this uh, it's covered kind of in the Baptist faith and message they kind of talked about it and clearly took a stand on this uh, last year I think and in, in, in a pretty big way it was pretty a nation nationally known I think way they took a stand on this and they unfriended if you will uh, some of the, some of the churches uh, their cooperation there and 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 so you know it, it's it's kind of reiterated in, in multiple places. And so this is just uh, uh, further. And, and again, it's, it seems to me it, it can be, uh, I, I definitely believe what the Bible teaches and I always try to try to stand on that. Uh, I would be complimentary in myself. And, um, and so I have no qualms there, uh, but it's just a question I think more for me of, do you know, it just, it seems to just go on and on and on. <laughs> and that's just what, and it seems like the stance has already been clear. It's, it's well known that it's clear. Um, and so Andrew, and I were talking, you know, I, I, we've read both sides and it's like, I, I don't know from my particular perspective, do we need, uh, okay, I see the verbiage. I wouldn't disagree necessarily with what you're saying for sure. Um, uh, but then on the other side, I don't know that I would completely agree with every, every point that the other side was making. So, uh, I think that, uh, it's always safe, safest for us, uh, to just stand on the scripture. <laughs> so, uh, I would default to the scripture and, uh, and stand on that, which is what they're striving to do. Uh, and I think the bigger question is not whether most people would it be in agreement with it but like you said it's is that do we need to take this step is this a necessary addition to be made uh, whenever it seems to be something that's already stated and something that's already clearly st- stood upon and um, and and so I, I guess that's uh, that's kind of the question up for debate with this law commandment is you know what w- 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 how far do you go? You know, how far do you keep going into the weeds? And and not that it's unbiblical, because I, I don't think that it is at all. I, I think it is biblical. But is it necessary, I guess, to to add an amendment to the Constitution when we have it covered in other areas, I think would be kind of the bigger question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you listen to us last year or anything at all, you know, we're very we said as much very complimentary and we agree biblically, not out of preference, just with the Bible says with uh, the language of this amendment, which are finally found um, the languages uh, the churches would be in friendly cooperation if they only have only men as any kind of pastor or elder as qualified by scripture. We believe that is so biblically yeah, that the office and um, role of pastor is limited to men, yeah, uh, qualified men biblically. Um, but I, I'm planning on voting against this amendment as we did last year for those reasons. I think it's kind of putting, at least from my limited perspective again, but putting the cart before the horse in terms of the ripple effects that this would provide. Uh, For one, and this might be minor compared to the others, but uh, these are very limited in nature, the points that are already here in the Constitution. We have one... uh, you know, regarding sexual abuse and the other against racism. Those are clearly matters of sin and not sin, biblically speaking. But here there's this, I would argue it's not a, and this is not the strongest argument again, but it's not a clear, as clear issues of sin and not sin as these are biblically. There's no, like if you have a a woman in any sort of role of pastor, that is sinful. And I am, uh, I feel for those churches who might be in a spot that tradition has had a, a position of like a children's pastor or a toddler's pastor or something of that nature to where they don't operate in the roles of, pa- of a pastor and they be complementarian. But similar to our church, I'm sure many other churches, we have uh, 
a lot of churches seem to have deacons that operate in the biblical role of an elder yeah. to where you're doing pastoral things. You have to be able to teach practically and uh, you're, you know, you're, you're keeping track of families, you're doing pastoral tasks. And in that case, that should be limited to men because that's a scriptural design, the complementary design, but yet it's in a different role. And that takes time. If you've ever been in a church, you're not, it, it takes time to turn that kind of ship. Yeah, even when you yeah. know that's correct. So if you're putting something in here, that's saying in the constitution, even though we all believe it's right, if you're putting that in there, it, it gives immediate access for someone who might be in the middle of that transition to say, you have to make that change now and immediately, or uh, you're out. And it seem, that seems drastic to me. And maybe that's a slippery slope argument. I don't think so, just per the nature of what it says. Like there's no, uh, no exceptions written in. Similarly within that, people who are pro of it have different interpretations seemingly of what it means, which is troublesome for anything, let alone something this consequential that you're putting it into our governing uh, things, uh, governing documents. Uh, some people have said that if anyone is in a role that is not named pastor, but is operating as a pastor, then that should fall under this too, which just screams not unclarity to me. And in my position here, I'm the minister of worship and communications, at least in my mind, I believe in our mind, that is not a pastor. That's not an elder role inherently and would probably be open to a woman, you know, if yeah. that would be the case, you know, that's, and we believe biblically, if you're, you know, music leader, that's not, you it's know, not the same. Yeah. Yeah. But that's beside the point. So if that's the case and we're kind of being willy nilly, it seems like with the, what should be very specific language and very specific goals of that. And finally, I, we, it, it's already been established. So I can see in a, people like Al Mohler and, and Heath Lambert and all those people, they know a ton more than me and can probably shoot down those arguments. But as I've read both sides, those seem to be more compelling to me. It's kind of, uh, it's not overreacting, but acting out of, out of place with what's needed. Yeah. And I, I think it's not, you know, it's, it's a, it's a d difficult topic a little bit because it's not so much, it's, it's already being established where the belief is and what the Bible says. I mean, we have the Bible in front of us. We yeah. know it's very clear on it. So it's not really at this point, it's not, um, it, it, the theologically it's already been determined. Uh, it, it, it's agreed upon. It's known. And so that's really not the issue. Uh, the issue is the effects of establishing it in this way with this wording, the ripple effects that could come from that, that may be unintentional casualties, if you will. And that's probably not the greatest word, but that's kind of the idea. I think of if you word it like that and there's no like understanding, of, well, this one may be going through a process to reconcile, maybe something that isn't where it needs to be. Well, it's too bad. You know, you, you now have this stated as such that says that you're just done. Like, I mean, and that, and I, and I think that's the bigger, it, it's, it's that question that really is at, at, the heart of the issue when it comes to this being put into a document like the Constitution, like a, a primary governing doc, doctrine of not the primary, the word is that, but the but, you know, a primary governing doctrine of the convention. So uh, I think it's something valid to think about. And I think people are. And hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, I think that they are they are praying, they are researching it and that their vote will come very much from where the spirit leads them and convicts them and not just from. Um, uh, honoriness to lack of a better word, because sometimes people get very like, uh, and it's like, all right, well, you know, it's not that we, it's not that we disagree on the, the foundation of this. It's just that, is this necessary, a necessary step to further establish what kind of has already been established um, and just more direct and rigid way, I guess, would be would be the thought. And um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I, it's, I, one of the guys, J.D. Greer, was one of the article writers that um, that seemed to not be in favor of this. And uh, it's like anything else in, in church culture. A lot of times you have very intelligent people that would say, yes, absolutely. Then you have very intelligent people that would say, no, I definitely wouldn't. And it's like, all right, well, here you go. So what do you do? You go to the word and you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, help guide me. You know, you 
seek him and let him be the lead in that. Um, as long as the, the, the biblical foundation is where it needs to be, I think that's the main thing in it all. So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Which is encouraging on a broad spectrum. Even within the disagreement, there's overall agreement and we'd be there yeah, too. Right. Please that's don't right. hear us as saying like we're less complimentary than the next guy. Like, yeah, we want to yeah. hold the scripture as much as any Southern Baptist. Yeah. Uh, and we're with that. Uh, it's just the way we're going about it doesn't seem to be the best or most loving or most nuanced way that it needs to be for this gr- large of group of churches with as many different situations as there are churches it just seems to be a very, uh, not the best way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I told Andrew before we started, I said, I, I, I don't know that I see, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely where they are biblically, <laughs> but I look at both sides and I'm like, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's what you should. Well, I'm not sure if this is. <laughs> so it's like I yeah. can see. Usually, I it's easy to fall in. I can see both sides, kind of like, uh, yeah, I get that point, and I get that point. I'm not sure about that one. Not sure. So, um, but it is very encouraging to know that um, the effort, the underlying effort, is to be the most biblical that we can. We all agree on the biblical stance on it. And and they're just trying to fulfill that the best they can. And that is encouraging because it's a pursuit of biblical um, of biblical accuracy. And um, that's what we should all be pursuing. So that's a, that's an encouraging part. That's right. It yeah. is. It is. This conversation tires me out. Yeah. <laughs> no, gotcha. This is not. Uh, and I think that's encouraging as an ending note is that over we're united by the gospel and united yeah. by Christ. We're brought together by him and that uh, some people might find great enjoyment in this kind of conversation. I know uh, I do privately, but publicly talking about it, it just (laughs) seems like, what's the point? Uh, And some of that might be true, but uh, thankful to a God who, uh, who, who, who made the small things with as much detail uh, as he did the big things in that he's got a perfection in that way. He didn't just set the world in motion and say, uh, have at it uh, to yeah. any of the created order at all. Uh, but he showed great care and love in his design. And uh, we we want to do that as well. As we get the details, we want to reflect Christ in the way we play those out, as well as the decisions and things that are made uh, for his glory and to reflect him. Yeah. Yeah. And please, please don't hear. I mean, sometimes if you're listening to this, maybe this is the first time you've tuned in to the Jesus follower. This is, this is not necessarily a normal episode. We, no. the, 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 the whole goal is to keep people informed. And, uh, and, and as we look at, think about, uh, being a Jesus follower ourselves, to, uh, to just talk about how in, in the Rolling Hills Baptist church and the association we're involved with, to think about how we go about trying, and the convention goes about trying to be as most biblically accurate as possible. Um, and so I know it can be wearisome sometimes to listen to, and the minutia is uh, sometimes very prevalent. But nonetheless, uh, it is all in a very good pursuit of biblical accuracy, and we can't miss that. And that's, as Jesus followers, what we all strive to have in our life and in our uh, just lifestyles in general, in our functionality is that we are functioning as the Bible and God ultimately wants us to for his glory and for his kingdom um, and becoming sanctified and more like Christ daily and weekly and monthly. So um, that is our pursuit. So don't get, don't get weary with all of the, what, what wearies us. <laughs> okay. It's yeah, just, uh, yeah. uh, just hang in there. And um, sometimes this is a part of it, but man, there's always, God is always faithful, even in the weeds and in the details, you know, he's always incredibly faithful and we can always rejoice and worship him because of that. That's absolutely right. And uh, yeah, we've just been having discussions, if you've been listening to us recently, about discipleship at our local setting. Like, what does it mean to make disciples in uh, Fairfield, Ohio, at Rolling Hills? And um, we've, we believe, been led to some answers in that regard. Yeah. And even financially, church wide, uh, we believe that the Southern Baptist Convention the Cooperative Program and the work that's being done missionally for the gospel falls in line with that. And we reflect that in our church's uh, budget yeah. um, to partner uh, with each other and with you all um, in that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's encouraging to see what God's doing and we're praying for uh, civility, humility and um, golly decisions to be made. Yeah. 
at the meeting here in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, if you've tuned in for the past few weeks, you mentioned life groups. So I just ask you, we would oh, ask yeah. you to continue to pray for that. That is set to launch this coming Wednesday. Uh, so just less than a week from uh, today. And so uh, if you haven't got a chance and you've joined in, you maybe heard about it and it slipped your mind. If you don't care, uh, be in prayer with us about that. You know, we're excited uh, about the possibilities that God has in store as he leads. And we just want to make sure that uh, we definitely don't come at it thinking we have all the answers, but just really trying to be the best Jesus followers that we can be and follow him and everything and create an environment here that can be Christ-like in the sense that discipleship and reproduction is happening uh, in the life of the church here. Rolling Hills. Uh, so I just, uh, just a quick shout out to that. If, uh, if you could make, if you could convey that in prayer with us, we'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah we're looking forward to it and, yeah. and please come out. Uh, if you, yeah, if, if you can, uh, there'll be no asking to commit to something long-term immediately. Uh, yeah. We just, uh, you may get severely embarrassed, but <laughs> no, no, you won't. It'll be welcoming and good, but, uh, but yeah, we're very excited about that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, thanks so much for tuning in with us. We uh, hope you'll come back next time and yeah, we'll follow Jesus together. That's right, right? Have a great day. Yeah.